Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so uh, we're very, very, very happy to have uh, Brian here um, to talk about non-interactive non uh, verifiable computation. Brian was a graduate student at CMU where his advisor was Adrian Perig, and he now is one of our own. He works in the security and privacy group of Helen Wang, um, you know, all the way across the, 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 the big chasm from uh, our building. But uh, welcome. Thanks, Manu. Um, so, like I said, today I'm going to be talking about non-interactive verifiable computing. The first part of the talk is based on work that went into my thesis and also into a crypto paper um, and may be familiar to some of you. And then later in the talk I'm going to get into work that I've been doing here with Seni and Vinod and David Molnar um, to try and extend the work a little bit further. And so you'll probably notice the transition where we go from lots of pictures to a little bit rougher material and it's stuff that's still being worked on so I'm very interested in ideas or suggestions you may have. Um, so to dive in, the general problem that we're trying to address is that there's some person out there, say Alice, who's a scientist. She has a lot of work that she needs to do, but she doesn't have a lot of funding. So what does she do? She outsources her computation to the cloud. And she, so she has some problem she wants to solve and data that goes along with it, and she hopes to get an answer back. Mm -hmm. And based on that data, she's going to choose some new data and submit a new query and get an answer back. And unfortunately, from Alice's perspective, it's very hard to tell is the cloud doing what she's asked it to do, or is it doing something a little bit cheaper and simpler from their perspective? So obviously this is a hot topic right now. There's all kinds of people that want to outsource computation. There's the sort of distributed systems that have been around for a long time, SETI at home, Boink. There's our own personal offerings here at Microsoft, Azure, and also Amazons. And even the, the other realm, which you might not immediately think of, is mobile computing. So you have this sort of weak client device. You'd like to outsource your computation to something stronger. Um, but the big question is, can the results you get back trust, be trusted? So there's no point in doing this outsourcing if you can't rely on the results you're getting back. And so we'd like to provide some higher level of assurance about them. And so to be a little bit more precise about the goal, we'd like Alice to be able to specify some function to a third party who is, in this case, untrusted, and supply an input for that function and get back the result of applying the function. And then she should be able to adaptively choose new inputs based on that output and get back additional inputs, hopefully polynomial many. Um, and the key requirement here is that we want to have integrity. So we want to know that the results coming back are correct. Now, an additional requirement that you might have is secrecy, either for the inputs, the outputs, or both. Now, some applications like SETI at home don't care about secrecy. They're doing scientific computing. It's an open process. Secrecy is not important. If you're doing medical data or outsourcing rendering of your latest uh, film, then secrecy is very important. And of course, the key constraint that makes this interesting is that you have to do less work to prepare and verify the information than computing the function yourself. Otherwise, why bother? Um, and so there, there's been some previous work in this area, and it falls into two main categories. The first is verifying specific functions. So for example, um, early, I guess, 2000s, uh, there was some work on verifying the inversion of a one-way function. And so for that specific class, it's a little bit easier because you put in some answers that you know, and ask for the inversions on the one you don't know, and do some comparisons when it comes back. But obviously, that doesn't work for all, all functions. Similarly, anything in MP presumably is easier to check than to do yourself. Uh, but there's lots of other interesting functions that don't naturally lend themselves to this kind of approach. And then there's work on general functions that have largely come from the, the PCP family. So the prover generates a large PCP proof, commits to it in some fashion through random oracle, for example, and then re selectively reveals bits about it so that the uh, guy outsourcing the computation can verify that the proof actually exists and is correct. And so there's been some work on reducing how much you rely on the PCP, but anytime you get PCP involved, everything gets much more complicated, larger, and harder to deploy in practice. So it would be nice to avoid this machinery if, if we could. And so the other interesting point is that none of these consider data privacy. So all this previous work was just about the integrity property, not, not about secrecy. And for some of them, it's actually somewhat complicated to think about how you might go about adding secrecy on top. Um, so in contrast, the protocol that we developed within this framework is generic, works for any function. It's uh, 
avoids all this complexity of uh, PCP CS proofs, and it's asymptotically optimal in terms of the amount of CPU and bandwidth utilization. It's non-interactive, so I, I hand off the problem, and eventually the answer comes back. I don't have to help you along the way. And it has this nice property of preserving input and output secrecy. So looks pretty good. Uh, we'll get into later in the talk why there, there's some drawbacks to this approach, though. Uh, and so in general, I'm going to go into this generic protocol that we developed and explain how the construction works, what its advantages are, what the disadvantages are. And then in the second half of the talk, I will talk about some of our more recent efforts about making it even more practical and trying to get it to where, somewhere where you might actually envision running it on, on a computer. So at a high level, one of the changes that we made in this problem area is to change the, the model a little bit. And we did that by introducing an offline phase in which you perform some amount of key generation. And so the idea is that you're going to do this one time for, say, for a function and then amortize that over many inputs which you want to evaluate that function. And so when you're in the online phase, you're going to choose some new input x. You're going to generate a problem uh, instance from that using your secret key. You're going to give the, a portion of that to the worker and keep, keep some secret information potentially to yourself. The worker is going to execute a compute function on that input using the public key that you've supplied and eventually produce some alleged output. And then you have a verification function that's going to tell you what the actual answer is or that the worker has tried to cheat you somehow. And so by doing a whole lot of these instances for a given function, we hope to amortize the initial work that we have to do for this, the setup phase. You don't even decode the answer? Um, so the decoding is, is part of the verification. So verification spits out the decoded output or so some, some, some bottom. Or yeah. Uh, so one of the key insights here was that if you look at uh, Yao's, Yao's garbled circuit computation and make a few tweaks, you can turn it into what we call a one-time verifiable computation. So you can verify a, a, single comp a single input computation. And so at a high level, what, what we do here is we choose the function that we want to compute. We convert it into a circuit. We apply Yao's garbled circling technique, which I'll, I'll go into in a few more slides. And we send the circuit to the worker. We then choose an input, garble that input, again, following Yao's techniques, send that to the worker. The worker then uses uh, Yao's techniques to apply the circuit. But it's important here that we're not doing any oblivious transfer. So in traditional Yao, we have two parties that, want to, that both have secret inputs. Here, we only have Alice supplying inputs. Um, second. And so, of course, the worker is not supplying in any inputs. He's just using the ones that Alice gives him. And when he gets the response, traditionally in Yao, you hand off a decoding table so the worker can tell what the answer was. But here, we don't care about the worker, except as far as he does work for us. And so we're going to send the encoded output back to Alice. And then she's going to use the decoding table to check the answer and make sure that it's a legitimate answer for this function. So that's the high-level view. Um, to go into a little bit more detail and to refresh your memory about how Yao's construction works, uh, the first step you have to take is to convert the function you want to compute into a circuit. Yes? So in the one-time computation, you didn't really say on the total computation that you could have computed the circuit on your own, right? Yes, exactly. So a one-time computation is not very useful, but we have a sort of generic technique for transforming a one-time computation into multiple. Yep. Yeah. Following crypto tenders, there was chess tenders. Somebody, chess, that somebody did Yao, and the penalty was a million to one. Are you in the same ballpark? Um, for using Yao? For using Yao. Um, Standard Yao, not the new modification. Quite possibly. Yeah, we, we have, we're using Yao fairly generically. Okay. Uh, so there's certainly been some work on how you can do Yao more efficiently, um, you know, Benny Pincus's group and whatnot. Um, but yeah, we, we still have all the slowdown that you would get from converting to a Boolean circuit and computing that way on computers that are not optimized for that. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you do have to convert to this Boolean circuit. You crank it through your, your favorite compiler, produce that. Um, and then the next step is to do this garbling. So this was what Yao was using for two-party computation back in the 80s. Um, and the idea is that for each gate and for each wire in the circuit, you're going to choose two wire labels. So for a, wire A, we choose A0, A1, B0, B1, and Z0, Z1, where each of these values is choos chosen from some large space dictated by your security parameter. So then we're going to write down the truth table for the gate. So this is an AND gate. You can check, make sure I did that right. Um, and then we're going to replace all the bit values with the corresponding labels that we chose in the first step. So then to actually compute the garbled version of the gate, we're going to encrypt each value of Z with the corresponding values of A and B as keys. And so for the first row in the table, we're going to encrypt Z0 using A0 and B0 as keys, and so on throughout the table. 
And so we're going to say that the garbled representation of this gate is these four ciphertexts. So randomly permuted, What's that? Also randomly permuted. Yes, yes. For Yao, it's important that you, you randomly permute this. Um, for our purposes, it's not, not as important uh, because we're just doing the integrity part. Um, so then to garble an input, it's very simple. You, you pick the bits, you convert them to their corresponding labels. Um, so A1 and B0 in this case. And you can do that for all of your label values. And so Alice is doing this whole process for the entire circuit, the entire input, sends this whole big collection of ciphertexts over to the adversary along with the input, and then he has to do the work. So how does he do the work? Well, for each of the four ciphertexts, he takes the first garbled input that he's been given and tries to decrypt all four. So for this example, it'll work on the last two. Then he takes the second one, tries to decrypt all four, and only works on the third one. So as long as you use a decryption function that makes it evident whether decryption has succeeded or failed, it's very easy for the worker to say this is the output of this particular gate. And clearly you can propagate this through because then the, the z0 becomes an input value to the next one and you use that to decrypt the next set of ciphertexts. So the worker can do this all the way through the circuit and wind up with some representation corresponding to a series of wire labels for the output. In this case, just z0. So then Alice has to check and make sure that he did the work she asked him to. The way she does that is she compares the value she got back. If it's z0, she concludes the answer was a 0. If it's z1, it was a 1. And if it's not, none of the above, she concludes the worker was trying to cheat her. And so simple security analysis, this is to say that if you don't want to get rejected as a worker, you have to produce either z1 or z0. They're large random numbers, so chances of guessing are small. And the only information you have about the wrong zi value was via the ciphertext to which you don't have the proper keys. And so as long as you choose a good encryption system, then your information about this is computationally negligible. Good. So, um, but we do have this problem, as somebody mentioned, that it's insecure to reuse these, these circuits. And it's easy to see if Alice chooses a, a new input, say 1, 1, computes the garbling, whatever that happens to be, and sends that over to the worker, the worker can simply ignore whatever she, he was given and send back the exact same thing he returned last time. Right? And so in this case, it was z0. Alice will look at it. It's a legitimate value for the output wire label, so it's one of the two z values. But in this case, it's, it's the wrong z value. And so Alice is tricked into accepting a 0 when it, when it should have been a 1. And so the interesting observation here is that the only reason he's able to cheat is because he's recycling this old knowledge. So it's because we, we gave him some bit of information he didn't have in the first round that he's able to cheat in the later round. And so what we said was, all right, well, let's add another layer of encryption. So to try and get rid of this information that we, we gave up in the first round. Um, oh, and sorry, the, the first point is that you can't just simply throw away the circuit and compute a new one because obviously that's as expensive as doing the computation yourself. And so what we really need is some manner of recycling this circuit so we can use it over and over again. Um, and in particular, the way we're going to do that is using fully homomorphic encryption. And so fully homomorphic encryption means that if we have two ciphertexts, we can take an arbitrary function, evaluate it over those ciphertexts, and get an encryption of the uh, function on the underlying plaintext. And in particular, an interesting function you might want to apply is the decrypt function for the, the Yao encryptions. And so what this gives us is an encryption with a homomorphic encryption system of the decryption of B with A as a key. And of course, it's important to note that fully homomorphic encryption on its own doesn't give you integrity, because if I give you a bunch of homomorphically encrypted inputs, you can compute whatever function you want over them and I'll still get a legitimate set of uh, ciphertext as, uh, on the return. Yep? Do you have any estimate how slow that would be? Yes. Uh, fully homomorphic encryption is very slow. So You build it on top of VR. Yes. <laughs> so current, so I think uh, Craig and uh, Shai have an implementation of Craig's fully homomorphic encryption scheme and it runs anywhere from, I think, Minute, minutes to lots of minutes to do, to do a bit of this function f. And then, okay. and then so for each gate, for each f gate that you want to do, that it takes on the order of minutes. And so for our purposes, if we want to do, say, decrypt, which you know, AES has maybe 10,000 gates without a whole lot of optimization, then you're, you're looking at days to weeks per verifiable gate. 
but, but the, the costly work is only the evaluation, right? The, the encryption and decryption are fairly are fairly simple. Yes. And the evaluation is only done by the by the server anyway, or not? Yeah. yeah. So the I mean, the server it's still not practical because yeah, yeah, even yeah. for a server, it's it's a lot of work. But it's at least yeah. So from from the perspective of the person doing the outsourcing, it, the the trade-offs are are good, <laughs> right? So so Alice doesn't have to do a lot of work compared to the amount of work that the worker does. On the other hand, Alice may be paying you know, Amazon for each compute cycle, and so expanding the work factor by you know, weeks is probably not, not optimal. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, so how do we apply this? Well, we do the same thing that we did before. We compute the garbled circuit, give it to the worker. And we compute the same garbled input, but this time, rather than giving the input in the clear, we choose a new public key for the homomorphic encryption system and send the, an encrypted input to the worker. The worker uses the key to homomorphically encrypt the circuit, and then apply it to the, uh, the input that we've given, and that'll result in an encrypted version of the garbled output. And it's important to note, if you sort of naively apply Yao in this case, you get something that's very inefficient. And in a few slides, I'll, I'll show you how you can do, do this a little bit more intelligently. Now, on the order of magnitude that we're talking about, it probably doesn't ma matter that much, but it's a, it's a nice optimization. Um, but the worker can't make anything out of this. All he has is a, a, a ciphertext, and so he has to return it to Alice who has the key and hence can decrypt this result that she got and do the checks that she did before. And so now, of course, when she wants to outsource a new input, say W, all she has to do is garble it and choose a new public key for the homomorphic encryption system, provide the public key, the worker has to convert the circuit into an encrypted form again and apply it to this new input. Once he's applied it, he's going to get a new encrypted output, return it to Alice. Now, the nice thing about this system is that we can repeat it a polynomial number of times by just choosing a new public key each time and if the worker ever tries to recycle something that he saw before, it's very obvious that he's cheated because it's going to decrypt badly with our, our newly chosen key. Um, so before going into sort of the YAL optimization, this last step, sorry, question? So what property do we, why do we need a new public key every time? We need a new public key every time because, so if we recycled the blue key, for example, then we could give him the, a, a blue version of W and then he's just going to give us back blue version of y again. So uh, he, we run in, you'd run into the same recycling property. Right. It's by, by changing this key, we guarantee that if he ever tries to give us back an old output, we know because it's, it's going to be encrypted with, with a different key than it was before. So what property do you need from the encryption scheme to prove this? From the uh, verifiable? Uh, from the homomorphic encryption scheme? Um, I think. If it's semantically secure, it's not, it's not malleable with different keys, right? If, if I give you encryption of a message under one key, you can't construct encryption of a related message under a different key. That semantic security already guarantees you, right? Yeah, that's, that's, so only, that's the only thing you need to do. So semantic security does the trick. So NCPA gets us through, which is important because a fully homomorphic encryption scheme is never going to be CCA secure, not, at least not in the, in the traditional sense, right, by, by definition. And so, so this transformation that we've applied here actually is a, is a generic transform. So we can take any scheme that's one time verifiable, apply this transformation, and wind up with a, a generally verifiable computation scheme. Actually, uh, sure. Can we go back? Yeah. So another thing is that if you encrypt into the same public key, then whatever attack you can carry on if I give you the L in the plane without encrypting, you can also apply the same attack inside the encryption. Right? Yes. Because it's really more. Yeah. Okay. Now, that attack cannot be taken care of if even if you can it be taken care of even if you change the public key. Well, what, what do you mean by an attack? Yeah. So if it was the same public key, you can carry out this attack. Yeah. When you change the public key in between multiple executions, yeah. I assume that someone can carry the answer to. So it's like what Vinod said before. Just think of a case that if you could do anything like this, then you could just, even if you had just one public key, you could generate another pair of secret key public key for the fully homomorphic thing by yourself. And just if you could do anything helpful between the two keys, then you can also do it with the key with the second key that you generated uh, by yourself. So semantic security itself guarantees that these no, sort no, of things. No, no. So here the, the, the goal would be to force incorrect output. The goal will not be to learn anything about the output. The goal will be to force incorrect output. And if it was the same public key, I could force the incorrect output. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Right. But uh, the, 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 the attack is to correlate what you learned in the first um, execution, either in the clear or in the inside the cipher text, yeah. to do something bad in the second. And what I'm saying is, what, what uh, I guess what Brian is saying is that if you use two different public keys, then you get normality. 
what you learn in the first case, inside or outside the side effects, doesn't help you in the second case. Yes, at least you cannot get it in the, under the new public key. You could under the new public key, but then that's what. If you don't, then you. Yeah, it might help. So let's, let's, there's actually, a, we can look at a second example where we go from a one time verifiable scheme to a, a fully verifiable scheme. Uh, and so this was from a, a scheme from crypto that was. Uh, if you're familiar with the reCAPTCHA system, where you enter two words on the internet and they know the answer to one and the other one is used to help with OCR, it's very similar to that. Uh, so the idea is, so we're gonna build it up from a, a very simple scheme. So Alice wants to verify the computation on a single input, so she chooses some random input herself and pre-computes the function on that input. And then when she's given a random input X, she sends both X and R to the worker and the worker is expected to compute F on both of those and they're randomly permuted and so when it comes back, Alice just compares the, the results she computed and makes sure that that one's correct and then checks and then accepts that the other one's correct. Um, so soundness one half, so you could repeat this a whole lot of times. All right, but we don't want to compute on arbitrary, on random x's, we want to compute on specific x's. So the way you get rid of that is you, again, pick r at random, you pre-compute f of r, but this time we homomorphically encrypt. Now this is not the transform, this is layer one of homomorphic encryption. Uh, the input r and homomorphically apply the function f. So this time we're, we can pick an arbitrary x and we're going to send a, an encrypted version of x and an encrypted version of r to the worker. And so essentially we've gone back to the first system where we had two randomly what appears to the worker to be two randomly chosen inputs except that now we can pick x arbitrarily. So even an x that the worker might anticipate. So now the worker has to return encrypted versions of these two and we can compare this homomorphically encrypted version with, with the one that came back. Uh, and there's an interesting catch that you can't, you might think that you could pre-compute just f of r and sort of decrypt these two that come back and then do the comparison, but that actually leaves you open to an attack. That, that, that's a bad idea. So it's important to do, do the check this way. Um, you mean compare f of r with what you get? Like it's trans trans compute the homomorphically encrypted f of r yeah. to... Uh, now it seems Alice is doing as much work as a worker and paying for all the homomorphic stuff too. Yeah, so she, she's not winning yet. So <coughs> this is still building up a one-time verifiable system. So this still gives us soundness one half. How do we get up to better soundness? Well, you do that by just sticking an I here, right? <laughs> you have some K, KR values, KX values, you intersperse them, and based on how many you choose, you basically get one over two to the K. So on that order. Uh, all right, so now we've got soundness, but again, this is only one time verifiable because these, ski, these R's look the same. And so if I send the same R's each time, the worker will know which ones are the ones that he has to do the real computations for and can cheat on the other ones. So this is where the trick, oh, Melissa? Uh, no, so this is so that you can do multiple, um, oh yes, sorry, I'm sorry, yes, these are the same X value, so you, you check that not only are all the R values correct, but you also check that all the X values match. So I use the box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is the trouble with this uh, fuzzy notation here? Uh, so how do we convert this to a reusable scheme? Well, we apply a, uh, we apply a layer of fully homomorphic encryption on top of it. So basically we generate a new public key, encrypt all of this stuff fully homomorphically. He does all the work he was going to do before fully homomorphically. And this way, each time we choose a new random public key, we can recycle these R values and the F of R values that we calculated here. So if you thought that R's was slow, uh, you can try adding yet another layer of fully homomorphic encryption on it, and this part's gonna be, you know, age of the universe computation. Uh, on the plus side, this scheme lets you get, aw get away from the very large public key that we had before. So with the, the protocol I described, we have to transmit the entire garbled circuit in, to the worker and he has to do the, the encryption. Here, I just have to transmit the inputs. Of course, they're doubly fully homomorphic encrypted, so they're large, but you know, theoretically, it, it's a nice property. So the two approaches are really, uh, can you think of them as really the same, except that in, uh, you replace Yao by fully homomorphic encryption in, uh, when you go to Yao's? So you, you both have uh, fully homomorphic encryption on the top layer. Yeah. But instead of Yao, you get, you use uh, Yeah, so I guess theirs is a combination of this, you know, pick and choose plus fully homomorphic encryption. Pick and choose plus homomorphic encryption. Whereas Yao is a slightly different property. It's, I think. 
but yeah, it's two different ways of arriving at a one-time verifiable com computation and then the same mechanism for, for doing the recycling. Uh, so when, when you are doing, if you are doing the Yao approach, sort of a, uh, a naive way would be to say, take whatever gigantic circuit you would use to ordinarily evaluate Yao, so, so whatever that big program is, and evaluate homomor fully homomorphically. Now that's expensive because the eval step is you know, the, the size of that circuit. So you might want to do it simpler and do it in pieces. So for example, you might encrypt each one of these ciphertexts with the fully homomorphic encryption key, and then restrict yourself to only evaluating the decrypt function. So that's naturally going to be much smaller than the larger function that calls decrypt, looks at the outputs, does some work, and so on. Um, and so that seems nice because we're, we're just mimicking what, what Yao would have done before, and it's just happening inside of the fully homomorphic encryption. Um, so we're decrypting with the second value, and we wind up like this. What, what's the potential problem here? Yes, exactly. So in the old Yao, we could just look at the third value and say, aha, this looks different from the other ones. But now, now we can't check directly, so we are forced to homomorphically uncheck. Uh, but the advantage is that both of, we can do that you know, via simple addition, and the encryption s scheme or the decrypt function can be very small. And so you know, overall, this gets you a more practically efficient than doing the entire Yao process inside of the garbling. Um, of course, at the cost of fully homomorphic encryption schemes, it may not matter a whole lot, but it's a, we'll take what optimizations we can get here. Uh, so in terms of the proof sketch, it's what, what we discussed. Yep. That, that sigma is concatenation? Uh, uh, so, an actual sum. So we, we just assume that the, the decrypt function either returns the, uh, cipher, the plain text if it's the correct key, or zero. Oh, zero. Not, Sorry. So. Uh, yeah, so, so the proof basically goes in two stages. Um, first, we show that Yao is, in fact, one-time verifiable. And you can basically reduce that to the security of Yao as a multi-party computation. Um, and that's because you can take all of these encryption values that we had before representing a gate and slowly replace all of the inner illegitimate values with the legitimate values. Right, so at the end, you wind up with a circuit where only legitimate output values are available, so the adversary can't possibly produce the, the cheating output. And as long as your encryption scheme is in CPA secure, you can't tell the difference between the two worlds. So once you know that Yao is one-time verifiable, you have to take the second step, and that's based on the semantic security of the fully homeless <coughs> encryption system. And so there, we can slowly replace these input values with randomly chosen values. And so the worker is going to proceed through the circuit just as he did before with these random values. All the decryptions are going to fail. He's going to wind up with some encryption of zero. But because of this, the NCPA property of this encryption scheme, he can't distinguish that. And so isn't going to learn anything helpful. Uh, so just to summarize, we have these nice properties that we have a generic construction, because any f that you can turn into a circuit will work. It's not interactive preserves the input and output secrecy, just as sort of a side effect in, of using this fully homomorphic encryption. Um, and it has nice asymptotic performance. So from Alice's perspective, she does this one-time computation of garbling the circuit, which is linear in the number of gates. Then for each work instance that she wants to outsource, she needs to garble and encrypt the input, which is linear in the number of bits in the input. The worker then homomorphically applies the circuit, which technically ignoring security parameters, is linear in the number of gates in the circuit. And finally, we do the decryption, which again is just a single operation per output bit. And so at the end, we wind up with something that's linear in the size of the input plus output from Alice's perspective. And it's linear in the size of the circuit from the worker's perspective, which is nice when you're, you're paying for these computations. So you know, theoretically, this is a pretty nice system. Um, but there are some drawbacks. So one is that we're only achieving efficiency via amortization. So if you're only going to evaluate the function a handful of times, then this is not the way to do it. That's true also for the other solution we are able to Yes, right. yeah, because they, al they also do the pre-computation to determine what the correct right. output should be. Is there any solution which doesn't require amortization? Um, I believe that's the, the, PC the PCP ones. Okay, this is right, because somebody just shows up to your door and says, hey, I've got this proof, and they, they give you the short little hash. So then there's this you know, big elephant that we're using, fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, which we've already talked about how, how slow that can be. Um, and so interesting. And then there's this additional interesting question of how do you respond when you catch a worker cheating? Mm -hmm. So say, say the worker does send something back that doesn't match what you were expecting. You might think, OK, you know, you're going to send him a nasty letter. You're going to deduct some money from his, his account, what have you. The trouble is with, with our current construction, we can't make the proof go through when we provide this extra feedback to the worker. 
And the way you can think about it is that the, work, the, the worker can speculate as to what the correct output label is. And using the fully homomorphic encryption properties, he can basically toggle one of the bits in the output label. And he can submit that to us. And we're either going to say, yes, it's correct, in which case he knows uh, what that bit was. Or uh, we're going to say, no, you're cheating, in which case he learns a bit. Um, and so if you could say, anytime you catch somebody cheating, you, you recycle, you regarble the circuit. And maybe it's worth paying that extra cost for having caught somebody. Um, but it's not, it seems undesirable. The other thing you could do is, you know, say in the morning, SETI at home could send out all their units for work, uh, then collect all the results, and then late in the evening, run the check over a million people and catch all the cheaters that way. Uh, and so, yep. If I catch somebody cheating, I don't do any more business with him. <laughs> and, uh, so, but are you using the same encryption for a bunch of workers? Is that the problem? Yeah, so I think in the, ideally you'd like to be able to use the same encryption across many different workers, and then you can't tell which ones are, are colluding. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're right. If you were just using this per worker, then, then you wouldn't have this problem. Uh, and there's all, you, know, you can always throw lawyers at the problem then. No, before the lawyers, I just <laughs> throw the switch. Sure. Uh, and so some of the work we've been doing here at MSR is looking at how can we make these, the system more practical, sort of taking some of the, the same ideas, but something that is not going to take on the orders of weeks to, to compute. Uh, and so the high level idea is to say that there seems to be an interesting connection between verifiable computing and various proxy schemes. So proxy resignature schemes, proxy re-encryption schemes. And so just as a reminder, um, proxy resignatures were a primitive introduced by uh, uh, Blaise, Bloomer, and Strauss, and then later sort of more rigorously formalized by Antonesi and Hohenberger. Um, and the idea is that you take a sort of the standard definition for a signature and you add two additional functions. So one is a re-key operation which takes in a, a public key and a secret key from two different users and produces what's called a, a proxy key or a re-key. And the idea is that the, you can take this re-key and feed it into a second signature called re-sign. And what this lets you do is if you have a proxy key from A to B and you have a signature from A on some message, you can convert it into a message from B. And so essentially by, produce, by giving up your secret key here, you're basically saying anytime Alice signs something, it's OK to say that it, it came from Bob. Um, and so there's a number of properties you might want from this. So, um, and this is from Antinessi and Hohenberger, sort of defined a lot of nice properties. So there's external security, which means if you're not a participant, you should have the same forgery preventions as any other signature scheme. If you are participating, you want what they call internal security or, or limited proxy. So the idea is that if I give a proxy my key, then, or a proxy key, he should be able to produce signatures that were legitimately signed by the person who's the target of the proxy, and that, I, and that if the proxy holds the key, he shouldn't be able to forge my signature on messages that weren't signed by the person that I delegated to. And similarly, the person that I delegated to shouldn't be in danger just because I, I created one of these keys. Uh, in terms of functionality, there's a whole lot of different nice properties you might have. So you might want to say unidirectional. So that means that I can, I can give out a key that proxies from me to Vinod, but that doesn't automatically imply that you can proxy from Vinod back to me. Um, so it certainly maps nicely to real world relationships. Uh, That's kind of a security property, right? Um, let's just say, if I give you the proxy key from you to me, you can't sure. forge, yeah, uh, okay. I guess, your, your signatures. Yeah, you, you can think, I, I guess that depends. If you say that you need this functionality, then it changes what your, your definition of a limited proxy is. Um, then there's multi-use. So it might be the case that a proxy key can only transform a signature once, and then nobody else can transform that signature again. Or you might be able to say that signatures can be proxied an arbitrary number of times. Um, you might want a private proxy. So you might not want, to be able, want it to be the case that you can distinguish signatures that are the result of proxying from signatures that were sort of generated straight from the source. Um, transparent is very similar. Um, Non-transitive means that if you have a proxy key from A to B and B to C, you shouldn't be able to combine them into a proxy key from A to C. Um, and some other properties that probably aren't too important for our discussion. Um, so there's been a handful of existing implementations. The first one from uh, BBS is largely broken. It just doesn't stand up to hardly any of these properties that you might actually desire for the, the scheme. Um, the more recent papers proposed one scheme that's multi-use, which is nice. You can proxy arbitrary number of times, but it's bi-directional. So it's inherently, if I give out a key, 
For me and Vinod, it's going to go back and forth. They also have one that's single use, but it's only unidirectional. Or it's unidirectional, but only single use. Um, more recently, in this paper, Liber and Vinod came up with one that's multi use and unidirectional. So that's nice. But it has this problem that your signature grows every time it gets proxied and it, and it grow, grows linearly. And you can think of this scheme in some fashion as essentially giving out almost a certificate chain. So I sign something that says it's OK to take from me to Vinod. Vinod signs something that says it's OK to go from him to Seni. And so to proxy twice, you just sort of staple these, these certificates together. And that's why you get this linear growth. Uh, you know, there's a little bit more subtlety to it because they want to have that transparency property so they can hide where the signatures came from. But that's the basic idea. Uh, what are the assumptions there in these words? Um, Let's see. I think these are both based on pairings, so various uh, elliptic curve DDH. Standard things or? Yeah, I think standard. fairly standard things. Uh, this one is based on a, a slightly non-standard pairing assumption. Uh, it's like tri triple DDH or some, something like that. Uh, looked plausible. <laughs> um, so one of our ideas in, in this direction has been to say, what if we take this notion of proxy resignatures and generalize it a little bit into something we call threshold proxy signatures. <coughs> so we're going to have two algorithms that are very similar to these, but instead we're going to have something called threshold proxy key. And that's going to take in two public keys and a secret key and generate a threshold key. And the property of this threshold key is that you can have this other algorithm that says, if you're given the threshold key and a signature from A and a signature from B on the same message, you can convert that into a signature from C. So very similar from before, but we have this property that you need two signatures to advance to the third one. And so, if, yeah, so if you look at this, you can actually see that you don't, once you have these, you don't really need these. You could build this from, from something like this. And in fact, for our purposes, we can take the, this set of properties, and we don't actually care about all of this for circuit construction. And so all we care about is unidirectional. We want, if you're going through the circuit, it's important that you can't get part way and then sort of reverse your way back up to learn things that you, you weren't supposed to know. We need multi-use because, of course, circuits can have many hops. And key optimal deals with how big your, your proxy keys grow. Uh, and so the way you would construct this is you would say, we're going to choose proxy key, or choose signature keys for each one of these wire values, just like we did with Yao, um, using this key gen function. And then for each, uh, each one of the logic evaluations in that gate, we're going to generate a threshold key. So A0 and B0 lead to some value of C0 or Z, so we're going to set up a threshold key for that. And so you're going to wind up with four threshold keys that represent this gate's functionality. So then to use it, when you get some input out X, you choose a new random message. For each bit, you encrypt the message using the corresponding signature key. And then you give this to the worker, who then applies these threshold, threshold proxy keys to calculate his way through the circuit. Key? What's mm -hmm. that mean? So, so each one of these is a is a signing is a signing key, and so say the input's uh, zero one, she's going to use a zero to encrypt the message, and she's going to use b one to encrypt. The, oh, sorry, sign sign the message. Sorry. And uh, your message is going to be what? Just randomly. Uh, ra randomly chose a message from some reasonably large space. And so the intuition is that you can use the threshold key to proc or proxy your way to the a signature from Z0 or Z1, but not both, because you don't have the corresponding inputs. And at the end of the day, I can use the verification key to check that you have a legitimate signature from either Z0 or Z1 on the message I gave you. Um, so this is a nice property that the proof of security basically reduces exactly to the threshold pro proxy signature scheme, because the threshold proxies, you basically have to say that security depends on that I never gave you a signature with some combination of keys that you already have threshold keys that get you the output. Even though it seems like you're doing, uh, you can do an end but not an end, or is that something technical that needs to be solved? Um, no, with, so the threshold lets you get and, and then you can. How do you do an and this, uh, oh, you just switch, you just have a cross, okay, yeah, good, good. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have this nice property that because we're using signatures, we get around the adaptivity property, right? Because a signature scheme is designed by that if I give you a signature on one message, it shouldn't help you generate a signature with another message. So this seems like a promising approach. Um, the problem is, if we look back at these existing constructions of proxy resignature schemes, well, this one's broken. We're not going to use that. Uh, this one's bidirectional. No good. 
this one is unidirectional but not, doesn't have this threshold property. It's not, not obvious how, how to combine the two. And this one definitely doesn't, so they're out. And this one definitely doesn't have the thresholding property because you basically have these two long certificate chains and you can't easily just merge, this, merge the uh, certificate chains that are coming along. Do you have a, uh, okay, so we can't, can't use prior work, so we need to come up with something on our own. Um, and so one way in which we've attempted to go about this is to define a, a slightly weaker notion, which is additively key homomorphic uh, key proxy schemes. And so instead of, so we still have the sort of standard proxy definition, but we also have this additional property that we want. And that's that if you take messages that are signed by two different people, or take the same message signed by two different people and perform some operation on them, you can get the, a signature on the message with the, the sum of the two keys. So a little bit of a strange property, but not unimaginable. Um, and certainly weaker than the, the full th threshold property. Um, and so one way you could think about instantiating this is with RSA, or some, something like RSA. Right, so standard keygen and signing procedure for naive RSA up here. Then to rekey, you just give out the division of the two keys. For re-signing, you take, take the signature you're given and raise it to the rekey. And so you know, sort of check the math, you'll wind up with the message raised to the, the new exponent. And of course, this is added, has this nice key homomorphic uh, property here. Everybody good? OK. Uh, and so RSA construction, you would pick your, all of your wire labels to be RSA exponents. Or you ch choose the A, B, and Z1, Z zeros to be RSA exponents. And then you choose the other Z value to be the sum of the two. Uh, and so the way you could do this is for each gate, you're going to give out three or two, two proxy keys. One that takes you from A0 to Z0, and one that takes you from B0 to Z0. So that sort of gets you the OR property, and then the SUM will get you the AND property. So I think that speaks a little bit to your, your question from earlier. Right, so be, in this fashion, we're sort of taking advantage of the fact that OR shortcuts. You know, if you have A0, it doesn't matter what you have for B. You automatically get Z0. And similarly, for if you're given B0, you should automatically get Z0, regardless of A. Good. Uh, unfortunately, there's some problem. Well, so there's some good properties and bad properties. Good properties are this is clearly very efficient. It's just uh, exponentiation per uh, gate evaluation. It's easy to compute uh, to do the preparatory work and do the verification. It's yep. Uh, you mentioned efficient. Now, after hearing about <laughs> Gentry, it's efficient, but it's a it's a current minimum security level. How much slower is it than? Oh, still still. It's yeah. much more efficient compared to. Previously, yes. Prob probably not in the realm of you'd want to start a business you know, selling this as a service. Okay, uh, but I would say it's a, a significant leap forward <laughs> in terms of efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might even be able to get this adaptive security property because we're using something that looks kind of like an RSA signature. So maybe you get uh, that property <coughs> as well. The problem is we don't yet have a proof that this is secure. Um, and in fact, most of our attempts at proving it run into this problem that you're giving out this uh, rekey value, which is derived from the keys in the clear. Uh, and so one way in which you might go about embedding an RSA challenge is to set one of the, the Z0 Z values to be the, the challenge value on which you're, you're trying to produce a signature. So let's say we, we know he's going to cheat by producing a 0. So we're going to embed the, the challenge exponent here. So then we need to work our way backwards and make sure that we can produce signatures on the, the inputs that we're given. And we can do that based on our knowledge that Z0 is, uh, Ill, is not a legitimate value. Right? So if, if Z0 is not legitimate, that means we're never going to give out A0 and B0 because th they're not legitimate either. And so we can take advantage of that in our construction of the circuit that we're going to give to the simulator. The problem is that the way in which you compute those reveals information about the path that you took through that construction. And so an adversary can look at the distribution of those RK values and determine that they're not uniform. There's some, something weird going on with them. And therefore, he can, he can refuse to play the game with you. Uh, and that comes largely from the fact that we're giving, giving out those division values sort of in the clear and from the fact that it's hard to randomize them. Right? So, so one way in which you traditionally randomize RSA exponents is to multiply them by some random number and mod 
the order of the group. Right? But the whole point of using RSA here is that we don't know the order of the group. Because if, if we did, then it would no longer be unidirectional. Uh, so we don't actually have an attack on the system, but proving security seems to be tricky in, in this case. Yep? So is it crucial if you use RSA? Can you not use other because of this unidirectional? Yeah, so the reason why we picked RSA in the first place was that it gets you this nice unidirectional property that you can go, go forward but not go backwards because RSA, you know, even given the exponent, you, you, know, you can multiply or you can exponentiate by it, but you can't, can't divide. So something like you know, standard Diffie-Hellman or some other group-based thing, if I give you, uh, if I give you, you know, z0 over a0, you can invert that and then work your way backwards. Uh, however, one, one area which that's not the case is pairings. So we turn to pairings because it also has this sort of nice unidirectional approach. And again, you can define sort of a standard basic signature scheme. You define the rekey to look very similar, except now we can hide it up in the exponent. And then the, the resign operation just does a pairing. And we still have this nice additive homomorphic property. So that's exactly what I was <laughs> Because for the security proof, typically you can make these interactive assumptions, mm -hmm. right? And in pairings, it is usually easier to make the assumptions. For example, if I ask you, G is to a 1 over x plus a, then I can ask you for any random a. And even then, for any different a, you cannot give me G is to a 1 over x plus a, you know, x. And it is okay usually to make assumptions, but it is hard to make similar assumptions for RSA. Yeah. So it might still be that you can have a security here, then over there. Yeah, so with, well, the, what the parents get us are, you know, we're still, you know, efficient in, in the sense we discussed earlier. We get the unidirectionality from the pairing, it's secure and quite possibly adaptively secure, because again, based on signatures, but it has this big problem that we're using pairings, right? So we don't get the, the multi-use one. Once you do the pairing, you're stuck in the target group, and we, we can't get the unidirectional property again. And so that sort of implies that we can evaluate circuits that are Boolean formulas, right? Because Boolean formulas only require sort of one level of wire splits at the top. And one, once you've done that, everything is sort of uh, you have no wire splits in the rest of the circuit, and so we can use the pairing once at the beginning and then let everything run, run from there. Yep. There's another paper of Dan Bonnet on homomorphic signatures. Yep. How does it connect to this book? Yeah, so recent paper from Dan Bonnet and, uh, I forget the student. Free. Right. Free. Yeah. Free. Um, and, free. Hmm? Free. <laughs> uh, so with their paper, they don't get the amortization problem property. So they, for each computation that you want to do, you need this tag value that, that they come up with. And so, so the worker has to come up with this tag value that for each new computation. And coming up with that tag value is essentially uh, takes as much work as doing the computation himself. And so he can provide these tag values that anybody can use to do computations, but he sort of has to do amount of pre-computation equal to the amount of work that somebody else does later. And so it has the advantage that you can you know, do a whole bunch of pre-computation and then later when results come in, you can do very fast uh, verified computing. But the total amount of work you do to prepare is exactly equal to the amount of work the worker does, essentially. Does that make sense? You need some kind of normality. So, so what's, the, what's the idea, right? I'm going to sign my input, give it to you, you can compute a function. Uh, you can compute a signature on the result and give it back to me and I'm going to verify. Uh, but then the second time I'm going to give you signatures on a different input, and I, you should be able to like mix and match these signatures. Yes. So you have, have to sort of sign the first one using one tag and the second one using a different tag. Then you know, to do that. I, I need to. That kills the amortization. It turns out there's no need, no reason why that should be the case. But so in, in a sense, it is a limitation that you have to provide at least as many signatures and inputs as the number of computations you want to allow. Uh, so if I want you to do k computations, I have to give you signatures for at least k next. Yes. And the instruction. Yeah. So, so you don't get to amortize it the way that these other schemes have been doing? More problems than that. <laughs> it's a, yeah. so, well, first of all, they can only do limited number of, uh, they can do linear functions and they can do constant degree polynomials. Right? And even for that, I mean, the other problem. Okay. Yeah, so, so it has problem some nice properties, properties but. It is unfortunately not, not sufficient for this. Yeah. So we can do arbitrary number of times, but you're stuck with Boolean formulas, 
And Boolean formulas are somewhat unappealing because the amount of work you do, the amount of work you would save with this is you know, a constant fraction of, of the work to, to do the preparation. Um, so, but there is this interesting connection. I think Vinod and his intern were investigating the summer, looking at this looks a lot like sort of a, the boiled down part of an ABE scheme. Um, and so you can think about, and ABE schemes also are essentially largely limited to Boolean formulas, unless you do things like blow up the leaves to, to handle uh, other functions. And so there may be some interesting connections as to why they're stuck with Boolean formulas and why Boolean formulas seem to work well here. Uh, and so one other approach you might take is instead of doing additively key homomorphic and key proxying, you might have additively message homomorphic and message proxying. So this is a little bit of a weirder primitive, but if you imagine there's some master key generation, standard signature algorithm, and then for instead of doing rekeying and reciting uh, and of keys, we say that we use this master key to say that you get a proxy key from two different messages. And so for any signature on MA with any key, you can convert it to a signature with that same key on message B. So again, kind of a, a little bit strange, but you'd also want this additively pro additive property, which is less strange that if you have the encryption under the same key of two messages, you can add them together and, and get the sum. Uh, and so if you wanted to uh, build this, then it looks very similar to before, but this time we're going to associate a random message value with each wire, and we're going to give out all these rekeys, and then to do the computation, Alice is going to generate one new signature key for the entire input, and she's going to sign all the input messages using that key. The worker can then uh, proxy through the circuit, going from you know, two, two input messages, proxy it to a single output message. And at the end, we're going to wind up with a signature on one of the output wire value messages using that original key that Alice chose. So this time, we're, we're going via the messages instead of this, the, the keys. Uh, and so we've been working on an instantiation of this based on lattices, uh, in particular based on a signature scheme from Vinod and uh, some folks at IBM. Um, and it has the, the advantage that it does have this proxy property, so you can property, proxy from messages, and it has this additively homomorphic property. Um, unfortunately, there's a couple of limitations. So you can only do, can't do full-size circuits. Uh, you can't reuse it a polynomial number of times, you have to reuse it what do we decide, Pol uh, logarithmic, polylogarithmic. Uh, so you don't get as much reuse, but you get some, some reuse. But then there's this much bigger problem that this particular signature scheme has the property that if you give out a signature on two linearly related messages using the same key, then there's a, the adversary has a good chance that he can recover the secret key corresponding to your, your signing key. So it's important that you only sign uh, non-related non messages. And of course, when we're constructing these circuits, we're going to wind up with lots of linearly related messages because of this. We're, we're taking advantage of this additive property. And so until you get rid of this property, this, this construction is, is not going to work. So what, what about the bonsai construction of the, the bonsai construction of uh, Pika, uh, et al, they also? Yeah, we don't even know how to, if it's additively homomorphic. Right? So our construction is naturally additively homomorphic. Yeah. yeah. But no, their but construction that, is, uh, that also gives you the problem, right, I guess? <laughs> yes, yes, but uh, if you don't even have a triple homework, then uh, what's the point? Yep. Uh, if the messages are even as short as 128 bits, and you generate each uh, at most strong random, you need about 2 to the 64 messages before you get the linear relation or a process, you know? So uh, that would be if you generate all the messages at random, yeah. but for this construction, um, <laughs> We're taking advantage of this additive thing, so that we, so for example, the inputs might be A and B, and then we're going to define the output message to be that, and, and that's what eventually gets you into trouble. Yeah. So if you could pick pick them, if you had sort of the full thresholding that we talked about before, then you wouldn't need to pick them in this fashion, and then you could, then you'd be okay. Um, so this is it. lattice instantiation. So just to wrap up here, uh, since we're running out of time. This verifiable computation system of sort of doing a little bit of pre-computation work and then amortizing it over lots of inputs seems to fit nicely with what everybody wants to do these days, you know, pushing stuff out to the cloud. We found that combining Yao with fully homomorphic encryption yields this theoretically very nice uh, protocol for doing this, and that this method of applying uh, fully homomorphic encryption does seem to be generic given any sort of one-time verifiable computation. 
Uh, we can get a lot more practical if we turn to these, these proxy-based schemes. But unfortunately, we sort of have high-level approaches based on these proxy schemes, but we don't have uh, very good concrete instantiations. So that's what we've been spending most of our time on lately is trying to come up with concrete instantiations that match these definitions better. Uh, so if you have ideas or other possible approaches in this direction, we'd be very interested in talking more about that. And that's the end. So, yeah. Thank you. Question? Have you looked at the real life problem that people might may have cracked this way, which is the running of double agents in wartime? <coughs> as a double cross system. So trying to check, check answers against? Uh, you, th you think your spooks are working for you, but maybe they're not. Yeah, so the, I guess the, uh, the other one-time verifiable computation scheme that I sh showed does take some flavor of that, right? It, it gives you some unknowns and some knowns and then checks based on the knowns. Um, and that works well for, for one time. Um, it, in general, the problem with applying that notion that you, know, you could get rid of all this crypto stuff and just give out the same computational problem many times. And in fact, that's the approach that SETI at home largely takes. Um, but you're, you're never safe from collusion in that case. Right? There's always the possibility that you're giving out to a thousand people that you think are different and it's all one guy sitting in his basement somewhere. Um, yeah, that's certainly the, a popular alternative. Um, yeah, so, so if, you make, if you make assumptions about the workers not colluding, I think you can certainly make more. Yeah. Um, the other interesting thing to look at is, so all of this stuff has been building on the, the, the Yao construction, basically garbled circuits and, uh, and just basic circuits. Um, but you know, Yao was just sort of a very early secure multi-party computation protocol, and there's a ton of work done in other other ways of doing secure multi-party computation. So it might be interesting to look at, you know, can we take some of those techniques as well and adapt them to, to, to this setting? So even if you just care about, uh, about privacy and not even care about verifiability, then you still, I mean, there's no hope of, of getting rid of the fully homomorphic encryption, right? Because even, again, even if you just give up verifiability completely, yeah. you, still, you still need, you still get fully homomorphic encryption. So well, it seems right. like, uh, it seems like there is a limit to the, like there is a limit to the to how efficient this thing can get without also improving the efficiency of uh, fully homomorphic no. encryption. Uh, what if you give up privacy and you just want verifiability? No, no, I'm saying yeah. if you so want if you want privacy, privacy if you want privacy, if you want privacy, yeah, sure. fully. I mean, you, if you want privacy for general functionality, then yeah, that's exactly so what fully homomorphic is giving you. It's, it's not exactly right. Really. But it depends. I mean, fully homomorphic encryption implies or assumes like a lot of properties like compactness and sort of like sorry. Like compactness, right? But you so do need compactness, right? right? Because if you're safe, like exactly. Because otherwise, the, your communication complexity cannot relate to the size of the to the size of the computation. Otherwise, it's exactly like what you're trying to avoid. Because then even reading the right. reading the answer is going to be so. So maybe like if you if you maybe if you want efficiency, then you need to like explicitly focus on schemes that do not have that do not give privacy. Yeah. So in fact, these proxy schemes. At least some of the ones we've been looking at don't, don't give you privacy because you, you're going to use a different key depending on which inputs are coming in. And so it does seem intuitive that if you give up you know, privacy, yeah. that seems like a, a big give, you should be getting some... But the point <laughs> is that you have to give it up, it seems, yeah, if you yeah. don't want to... Sure. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Again, another old problem. Between the wars, there were lots of computation bureaus. You outsourced a problem to battalions of people with hand-cranked adding machines. They must have made mistakes, and they must have had procedures to handle mistakes. And of course, the people who remember are dying off. <laughs> but it may be useful to pick to pick some brains on this before they all die. Sure. And I think, so I think one of the differences in that situation is that you, at least assuming that your computers have not been suborned, you're largely looking for random mistakes and laziness. To, of and, and laziness. Yes. Um, but I think if you're looking for yeah, sort of the harder. yeah. Any other questions? Thanks, thank you, Brian. Thanks.